Welcome to the Nutshell Brainery Podcast. I'm Lon Schiffbauer, and today we're talking about economic bubbles. History is replete with impressive economic bubbles from the poster child that is tulipomania of the 1630s, railroad mania of the 1840s, to the dot-com bubble of the 1990s and the housing boom and bust of the 2000s. However, one bubble that is not often included among this esteemed company of economic crashes is the comic book bubble of the 1990s. Granted, the collapse of the comic book industry didn't have the far-reaching impact of those bubbles I mentioned earlier, but this particular case study is interesting for two reasons. First, it showcases all of the classic elements that comprise an economic bubble in ways that's easy for us mere mortals to understand. I mean, we won't have to watch a movie like The Big Short just to get the gist of what happened. Second, in some ways, this bubble is repeating itself as comics have made the jump from the printed medium to cinema and streaming services. Having found a new home in these media, the comic book industry seems intent on repeating the mistakes of the past. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin with the start of the comic book bubble. Part 1. The Comic Book Bubble – A Very Short History in 1974, you could buy a copy of Action Comics No. 1, featuring the first appearance of Superman, for around $400. Ten years later, in 1984, that same comic would go for around $5,000. Then, in 1991, a copy sold for an eye-watering $82,500. Comic books, those cheap dime store rags that kids used to buy with their allowance money, were now the hottest collectible out there. Not one to miss out on this wave, comic book shops started popping up all over the country. Of course, these shops traded in the rare old comics with rows and rows of white comic book boxes lining the walls, but even the newest editions saw breathtaking price gains. It was not uncommon for a comic to sell at its cover price, generally 60 cents to a dollar, only to then appreciate to 10 or 15 dollars just a few months later. Before long, a full-fledged bubble market had formed around comic books, and like all bubbles, this one too was destined to burst. By the mid-1990s, 9 out of 10 comic book shops in the United States closed their doors. Sales of new comics dropped by something in the neighborhood of 70 percent, and incredibly, on December 27, 1996, Marvel filed for bankruptcy. So what brought about this comic book bubble in the first place, and what led to its demise? Let's explore this. Part 2. Factors that contributed to the bubble. Let's start with rarity. When it comes to Golden and Silver Age books, rarity is all but assured, though certainly not part of the design. Back in the day, comics weren't thought of as collector's items. They were intended to be purchased by kids with money they earned doing chores, then folded in half, shoved in their back pockets, and passed around with friends after school. The lowest of all print media, these comics were printed on the cheapest newspaper stock available. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that these books started decomposing from the moment they came off the printing press. Because of this, few comics are intact today. Take, for example, Action Comics No. 1. Today, it's estimated that no more than 50 to 100 copies remain. This was all fine and dandy for the older books, but the newer titles couldn't rely on these factors to create rarity, so publishers had to resort to other methods. First, they created new titles. With increased interest in comic books, and with more retailers popping up every day, demand for comic books went through the roof. The publishers met this demand by increasing production and publishing more and more new titles. In 1985, before the market took off, Marvel published about 40 titles a month, each costing around 60 cents. By 1993, the number of titles ballooned to 140 books a month, most selling for $1.25 or higher. Then there were variant covers. Another way that comic book publishers fed this demand was through the introduction of variants. This practice involved publishing popular issues, such as first appearances, first editions, or origin stories, 
with various alternate covers, many published in limited quantities. Collectors and speculators would then descend upon the comic book shops in a frenzy, eager to pick up all the variants. This not only drove up demand for the month's issues, but increased aftermarket sales as well. The value of these variants rose dramatically during the early part of the speculation boom, with some issues selling for as much as $20 within a few months of publication. Then there were crossovers. To further increase demand for their products, publishers began launching more and more mega crossover events. A crossover event is a storyline that spans across multiple titles. It's not hard to see why this would be attractive to publishers. It basically forces readers who want to follow a story arc to purchase issues from titles they wouldn't normally follow. No longer could a reader follow the story by reading just one or two titles. Now they had to branch out to almost a dozen others. Furthermore, these crossover events last the better part of a year, turning a casual $10 a month hobby into a major $50 a month year-long commitment. While some of these crossover events were well-received, others were more cynical and left readers feeling disrespected and manipulated. Finally, there were gimmicky events. Traditionally, comic books that go up in value tend to be first editions, first appearances, origin stories, and character deaths. The flood of new titles made sure that there were more first editions for the speculators to pick up, but there was a lot more publishers could do. In 1993, DC published The Death of Superman, a major crossover event spanning 15 books across six titles, some with variant covers. In all, Superman 75, the issue featuring the hero's death, sold more than 6 million copies, making it the best-selling comic book to date. Other titles followed similar tracks. Batman Nightfall featured Bane breaking the caped crusader's back, opening the door for other characters to don the cape and cowl while Bruce Wayne recovered, creating a need to buy all the issues. Eventually, these events became very gimmicky, such as the time Marvel said Spider-Man wasn't Peter Parker after all, but a clone named Ben Riley. In addition to the perception of rarity created through these practices, there were other factors as well that contributed to the bubble. Let's take, for example, distribution. In the early days, comics were slow to make the jump from newsstands and five and dimes to dedicated comic book shops. This was primarily due to the barriers to entry distributors placed upon comic book shops. Distribution companies, Diamond and Capital City being the two powerhouse distributors in the industry, required that would-be comic book shops demonstrate financial viability as well as guarantee a minimum book count in their monthly orders. However, with the new comic book market raging in the country, Diamond and Capital City eased the entrance requirements for new merchants. Essentially, a $300 order could get you started. Predictably, comic book shops proliferated, growing from about 800 in 1979 to something around 10,000 in 1993. Then something of a stock ticker developed for comic books. In 1991, Wizard Magazine came onto the scene, providing the market with a monthly pricing guide for tens of thousands of comic books. While other pricing guides, such as the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide, had been around since the 1970s, Wizard brought the service into the mainstream, feeding up the information in a full-on glossy magazine with articles, spotlights, contests, and other features, all delivered in a playful comic book aesthetic. This helped to feed a speculation boom in which comic books were pretty much bought and sold like stocks. Then there was the low buy-in factor. The nice thing about comic books is there's a very low buy-in for new collectors. Sure, you may not be able to afford a copy of Incredible Hulk 181 featuring the first appearance of Wolverine, selling for about $10,000, but there were any number of less exotic yet still desirable comics one could purchase at very affordable prices. This way, everyone could participate in this boom market, making it grow all the more. Then there's speculation. With the price of comics rising so quickly and dramatically, it was inevitable that the comic book industry would attract market speculators, those who had no real interest in the comic books themselves, only in the profits they could potentially bring upon future resale. 
In many cases, new comics weren't even taken out of their Mylar bag, backed with an acid-free board. Mint copies brought the very best resale value, and there's nothing more mint than untouched. And then, of course, with speculation came stockpiling. Speculators saw themselves paying for their kids' college on the value of their comics. This meant buying multiple copies of any issue that stood the slightest chance of increasing in value and storing them in purpose-built comic book boxes. For even a more or less passive collector or speculator, it wasn't long before their basement or garage was filled with a dozen or more boxes, each holding about 150 bagged and boarded comic books. There was also a lack of visibility to leading indicators. Retailers placed their orders with distributors three months in advance. This meant that, from a publisher's perspective, they wouldn't have visibility to shifts in the market until they were well past the point of no return. This practice stung retailers as well since their unsold stock could not be returned nor future orders canceled. Pre-ordered tens of thousands of copies for an anticipated demand that failed to materialize left the retailers saddled with massive amounts of overstock. There also developed something of a rudimentary futures market. A common practice for comic book retailers was to set up something known as a pull or hold list for their regular customers. The idea was that the customer would provide the retailer with a list of the titles they would like to buy each month, month after month. The retailer would then pull these copies directly from their monthly shipments from the distributor and hold them for the customers. This way, the customer could be guaranteed to get the additions they wanted without fear that the retailer would sell out before they could make it into the shop. Well, some particularly entrepreneurial speculators would list multiple copies of a highly anticipated edition in their pull list, then resell these copies before they even came into the shop. This created something of a proto-future markets for these comic books. But of course, eventually, as with all economic bubbles, the community started to realize that the whole comic book economy was a house of cards and their fortunes were on shaky ground. Prices of the high-value comics that launched the boom in the first place declined or remained flat, while the mid-tier issues, those that traditionally sold for around $100 or so, lost significant value. None of this, however, compared to what happened to the new comics published during the height of the bubble. These became virtually worthless as the market was suddenly flooded with the inventories of out-of-business comic book shops, over two-thirds going out of business, and speculators trying to unload their stock before prices dropped any further. Before long, comics that once sold for hundreds of dollars were now all but worthless. Part 3 Parallels between the Marvel bankruptcy and today. The crash of the comic book industry took no prisoners. Valiant Comics, once the third largest comic book publisher in the industry, was acquired by Acclaim Entertainment. Other comic book publishers, including Malibu Comics, Eclipse Comics, Comico Comics, and several others closed down completely. But the real shock came in 1996 when the comic book giant Marvel declared bankruptcy. While hard to imagine, the math isn't hard to wrap your mind around. When a publisher sees a 70% drop in sales, pain follows, and Marvel was no exception. But while Marvel fell victim to the comic book bubble like the rest of the industry, there were other ways that the company contributed to its own demise. Things that, if they're not careful, they may end up repeating. Take, for example, new titles. In 1985, Marvel published about 40 comic book titles a month. By 1993, the number more than tripled to 140. We're seeing the same sort of title inflation happening today. In the cinema, Marvel Phases 1 through 3 included 23 theatrical releases between 2008 and 2019, 11 years in total. By contrast, Phase 4 includes 7 movies eight television series, a couple of holiday specials, and an assortment of shorts. This means Phase 4 had about 17 titles, all released within a couple of years. In considering these numbers, it's worth bearing in mind the watch time. Some of the television series include something like six to eight hours of watch time. This means that, in terms of watch time, Marvel has released in the past two years 
more or less the same amount of content as it did the previous 11 years. Then there are the new characters. In the comic book world, remember Maxima, Kane, Cybernary, Deadlock, Bedrock, Superman Red, Superman Blue, Shadowhawk, and Bloodwind? Neither do I. These and many other characters were introduced and just as quickly forgotten during the comic book boom. Likewise, I doubt I could count the number of new Phase 4 characters with any degree of accuracy. The Eternals alone introduced something like 11 characters, trying to keep up with the likes of Belova, Harkness, Rambo, Shang-Chi, Cersei, Kingo, Kate Bishop, Maya Lopez, Mark Spector, Steve Grant, Jake Lockley, whatever, Dane Whitman, Eros, John Walker, Kang the Conqueror, America Chavez, Clea, Kamala Khan, Jack Russell, Elsa Bloodstone, Jennifer Walters, and Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, and trust me, there are many more, is like trying to map the human genome. And in grand tradition, we have more crossovers. Comic book crossovers were frustrating to readers because they forced them to purchase and read comics that didn't necessarily interest them, but contained important details needed to follow what was happening in their favorite titles. Marvel is doing the very same thing today. Viewers are expected to subscribe to Disney Plus and watch shows just because they may include details that they'll need when watching their favorite characters in the cinema. Essentially, Marvel is assigning homework and requiring viewers to pay for the privilege of doing this busy work. And that brings us to increased prices. As noted before, Marvel now requires its fans to subscribe to Disney Plus if they want to have any hope of following the ever-growing web of storylines. Now, for many, $11 a month may not seem like a big deal, but for some on something of a fixed income, $11 isn't immaterial. It also presents an opportunity cost. Not many can afford to subscribe to more than a few streaming services. So by saying yes to Disney+, Plus, viewers are forced to say no to another service, all for the sake of their Marvel characters. Then we have the treatment of talent. During the comic book boom, comic book artists did not own their own characters. Companies like Marvel and DC retained all ownership of their employees' creations. What's more, publishers considered the artists to be less important to a comic book's success than the characters themselves. After all, readers came for Batman, Spider-Man, the X-Men, and Superman. Artists and writers could be easily replaced. It was the character that sold the books. Artists were just paid a flat page rate regardless of how much revenue an issue, title, or character generated. Some of the more celebrated artists took issue with this practice and tried to negotiate for better control over their characters, but the publishers refused. In the case of Marvel, this created a schism between the publisher and several of its top artists, eventually resulting in these artists leaving and starting Image Comics. Today, we are witnessing something similar in the treatment of CGI artists. Though independent contractors to Marvel, these shops are struggling to keep up with the amount of work demanded from them, all paid at a set rate. Whereas actors and others are often paid according to box office draws, CGI artists are paid at what is essentially an hourly rate, all while delivering the lion's share of what you and I see on the screen. This, of course, dilutes quality. The more than tripling of comic book titles and characters back in the 1990s took a severe toll on the quality of the stories and artwork. Likewise, the same can be said for Marvel today. When a studio forces so much content through the system, taxing the writers, crews, and CGI artists, quality is going to take a hit. When hobbyists working from their basements can take your product and improve upon it, all to troll your company, you know you have a problem. So in conclusion, the thing about economic bubbles is that we only see them clearly in the rearview mirror. And when we do, we wonder how anyone could have been so foolish as to think that this was anything but a house of cards. Truth is, we are forever building new houses of cards, all while thinking we're following the best practices and being responsible stewards of our resources. 
Marvel is no different. With phases one through three, they did something that had never been done before. So why wouldn't they think more of a good thing wouldn't be a great idea? And yet, their past success may have created the perfect environment for their eventual self-destruction. And there you go, economic bubbles in a nutshell. I hope you found this fascinating. I sure did, since, well, I was one of those schmucks who fell into this bubble. Thanks a lot for joining us today, and until we talk again, have a fantastic day. Hey, thanks a lot for watching this video. And well, if you're still here, you're a special kind of awesome. There are other ways that you can support this channel that we would like to invite you to consider. For example, we have accounts at both Patreon and YouTube community. They offer a variety of benefits. It's the very same benefits at the same price levels. So whichever platform you prefer, whether Patreon or YouTube community, we invite you to take a look at what's waiting there for you. What else do we have? We also have merch. I know, right? Every YouTube channel, it's like we're federally mandated to offer merch. Well, we offer merch as well. But in addition to hats and coats and things like that, we also offer study materials such as case studies and articles and study guides or even PowerPoint presentations. These are things that you can use in your own lectures or in your own personal or professional studies. We also have an Amazon affiliate link. It's in the description below. And like any other affiliate link, it doesn't cost you a penny more to order through this link. However, it really helps the channel. Furthermore, we also have a newsletter called the Brainery Bulletin, and we would love to have you subscribe. In this bulletin, I have a variety of, well, behind the scenes pictures and updates, things that I'm working on that you can look forward to seeing in your queue here soon. I also offer a variety of live stream workshops to all of my subscribers, so take a look at that. And then finally, if you like Nutshell Brainery, you'll love our podcasts as well. Once again, links in the description, so take a look and we would love to have you as our newest listener. All right, thanks again, and this time, for real, until we talk again, have a fantastic day.